We're going to be looking at two words that Paul used, that uh, John used, that were used consistently in the New Testament concerning our relationship with Christ. And it's simply the two words he says, in me, in me. Everything we have now and forever that we will ever need is found in Christ. Other places in the scripture it says in Christ. Many places it says in him. But I want it to be personal. So we're going to use these two words today that refers to you and his relationship with you based on what he did and what he does when he says in me. It is ours and it is not earned or deserved. Everything we need. All that is his. He says, it's all found in me. And we're going to just look at some things that I wrote down. And I've got some scripture verses for these, and we're going to read those. But uh, we're just going to look at these simple, simple things. This is not, this is not a fancy message today. I don't, don't have a fancy outline. I'm just going to share a few things. Jesus spoke these words over and over, in me, in me, in me, in me. And I think he was making a point. He says in John 14, 1, he said, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The word believe and the word faith. The word believe is the verb. The word faith is the noun. You could translate it belief, but it's the same word. And the word is pistuo. It means to have faith or to be faithed, or to believe. And we don't have a troubled heart when we're believing Him. Do you want a troubled heart? No, of course you don't. Believe Him. Believe Him for what? If you start with this premise and you believe that He who knows me from eternity past, who chose me from before time existed, He chose me in Himself, in love, he predestined me to adoption as sons. And if you're a girl, just say child. From before anything was ever created, he'd already done this. And we believe it. And we believe him. There is no death in him. So I'll read the verse again. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Well, you could say another way. Believe in the Father but believe in me. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He said, he who has seen me has seen him. Well, in John 15, verse 4 through 9, we see that in me you live. That's what Jesus said. In me you live. And this word is abide. You abide. You have residence. This is dwelling. In John 15, uh, verse 4 through 9, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, do you see this? He's saying it over and over and over again. Live, dwell. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. Now, you say, oh man, that's, that's harsh. He's talking about sending people to hell. No, he's not. That's not what this is about. This is a cleansing fire. What, in, what the part of you that doesn't bear fruit, it's removed by him, by the husbandman, not because he's mad at you. This is not punishment. This is cleansing. It's like people sometimes who have an infection and they'll do surgery and they'll remove the infection so that the good tissue around it will heal. That's what this is. And he says in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Do you see that? 
Delight yourself in the Lord. Do good. Cultivate righteousness. And he'll give you the desire of your heart. I was talking to a dear friend this week, and he's got an opportunity, a great opportunity. My dear brother, Ken, a great opportunity. And we were talking about it, and he asked me what I thought. And I basically said, Ken, just pray about it. Do whatever you want to. Because you see, God is the one who directs you, and he'll direct you that way. You say, well, I don't know what to do. And I ask people all the time, trust him. And then what do you want to do? And they'll tell me, and I'll say, do it. It's simple. We've made it so complicated. And then he says in verse 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Now let me say this. Do you realize when you abide, like he says in other places in this passage, in me, you are abiding in his love. When you are abiding, living in, dwelling in a place of residence in his love, you are living, dwelling, abiding in your place of residence in him. I say this just like I have it down. <laughs> that wouldn't be the case. I'm still learning. We still deal with this as time goes on. Well, he says many places in Scripture, so many I'm not going to quote them, I'm just going to tell you. He says, in me you have life. In me you have life. When the Father and the Son and the Spirit, before time existed, brought you, chose you, in him you were chosen before the foundation of the world. That's what it says, Ephesians 1, 4. When this happened, when you were chosen in the Godhead, in the Trinity, picture this, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have gathered around you and wrapped their arms in a circle, the three of them together, and you're in the middle, and they're literally dancing around you. You say, oh, that's crazy. We call that a circle dance. That's not crazy. That's exactly what they did. You see, they loved you so much that they chose you before they created you. You say, how can they do that? Simple. Because eternity existed before time. You see, in eternity, you've always been. In time, you were born. Adam was created in time. But in eternity, he always was too. In time, you believed him, received him, trusted him, born again. In eternity, he'd already chosen you. Now, I don't understand why some people on this earth don't believe what he's already done. I don't understand that. Some don't. But I'm telling you from his perspective, his love for you does not depend on what you do. In him, you have life. He says, or in me, you have life. He says, in me, you have peace. Let's read John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Many of you are going through things right now. You're going through things right now that lead to turmoil in your life. I mean things that are, that are bad as far as the world can see. And it's not just about health. It could be about family. It could be about finance. It could be about a job. It could be a loved one that's going through trouble. I don't know. But he says, in me, you have peace. Read it again. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Let me give you some advice. I'm not going to talk about politics. That's a mess. I'm not even going to talk about the world situation. That's even worse. But I am going to give you some advice. Stop watching so much news. You say, I need to know what's going on. Okay, I'm going to tell you what's going on. It's a mess. We got a bunch of, I think, dishonest people. I'm not saying all politicians are dishonest. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying everything that happens in the world is bad. But look for the good in people. 
you know, there are things, the wicked things that are going on. You say there is no good in them. Folks, just ask God, say, Lord, I want to trust you to reveal to me your love for all men. And then you, let me give you another thing. Smile at people. Do you know that if you smile at people and you don't smile at them after they smile at you, if you smile at people, sometimes they don't know how to react. Give you an example. I was in Pakistan some years ago, and Robinson's told me many times people don't smile over there, and I can understand that. And I didn't see them smiling either. But when I was leaving the country, now when I got there, first thing they did was take my picture. You ever had your picture taken when you go into a new country? They did in Pakistan. Because I was up to no good while I was there. I was telling people that Jesus loves them. And everything was pretty good until the Sunday before I left on a Monday. I was going to speak one more time that night. And that was the only place I spoke that wasn't secured. I still had bodyguards. But this place, we had to walk through a sea of humanity to get to where we were going. And uh, I would get ahead and my bodyguard, I had three of them that were surrounding me, walking with me. And they looked at me and they weren't smiling when they said this. They said, do not walk in front of us. And they weren't kidding. And I remember them asking me, will you pray for me? These were believers. And I said, man, I will. And they were there wherever I was. When I went to the bathroom, they went to. I mean, it was crazy. Well, the last day when I was leaving, we go to the airport. And it's not like any airport you've ever been in. I'm going to promise you that. A visitor can't even go in the airport. First thing that you do when you walk through the doors going in the airport, first thing they do is they x-ray your luggage. First thing. Then you go to the counter where you're going to check it in, and they x-ray it again. Nobody's smiling at you. And I was smiling that day so much at everybody because I was scared to death. Because every place I went, they had semi-automatic no, rifles. We used to call them machine guns, but they're automatic rifles. And they're holding them, and they're not kidding. And then when I got to where I was going to go back to where the terminal was, uh, they x-rayed my last thing. They x-rayed everything, but then they carry on stuff. And I had my Bible in my carry-on bag, and they stopped me. And they took that Bible out. It was contraband. And then I saw the guy walk off, and he wasn't smiling either. And I was smiling at him. How you doing? He looked at me, and I was smiling at him. And he showed it to a guy, and they looked at the Bible, and they looked at me. And then they started laughing. And then they came back and handed me the Bible. And then I walked through, and I thought, that was the strangest thing I've ever gone through. And they had guns, too. And then we're back in the terminal. I'm walking back to where my gate was, and I saw a McDonald's. And man, I stopped at McDonald's got a cup of coffee because anything that reminded me of home. And then I hear this noise, and it was like a soccer match. And there was a, a group of young men walking down, and they were all bunched up together. It's strange. And they were just screaming and hollering, just walking down. It, like I said, it sounded like a... A soccer match or here it would be a football game and they were walking down the, the the gated area just crazy making this crazy noise and I found out from a guy who was with the embassy and he was on the same airplane as me and he said they were going to Mecca their pilgrimage and he said don't get in their way boy I did not and at the time, I had pretty dark hair, and I just went and found a corner. And I sat in the corner and put my head down so they couldn't see my light face. And so that all they could see is my black hair. And so when we were getting on the airplane, and when that plane lifted off, I'm telling you, it was, it was like an oppression was gone. And uh, we were flying to Abu Dhabi. And I've been a lot of places in the world, but that was the one that really got my attention. And uh, And this guy that was... I don't know what he was doing. Uh, he didn't tell me what he was doing. But he stayed at the embassy. I know that. And I feel like he was probably in the CIA. I mean, he didn't, he didn't tell me. But I could see. And he said, what were you doing here? I said, well, I came here to tell him about the fact that Jesus loves him. And he got the strangest look on his face. And he says, they will put you in a dark hole for that. Well, I know that's true because they tried to kill Robinson. They shot at him. They shot through his car with his son in the car, multiple bullets. I mean, they just sprayed the thing with bullets, and it missed him. And 
he was warned and then they tried to kill him and then he was warned you need to go into hiding now and you need to get out of the country and that's why he's here but while i was there even though i was scared to death all i wanted to do was smile at everybody and you know what it changed the way i felt now, whether it changed the way they felt about me or not, I don't know. But it changed the way I felt. And so that's something we can all try. Just smile at people. Just smile at people. And it's it seems hard to believe something as simple as that. But it's not. In John 17, 21 to, through uh, 23, we see that in me we have oneness with the Father and the Son, and each other. Oneness with the Father, and with the Son, and each other. There are people in the room. I have my wife. I have oneness with my wife. Because we're married. But you know, even if we weren't married, I would have oneness with her in Christ. Andrew here. You know, I have oneness with Andrew. Not because he's my physical brother, because he's not. But he's my spiritual brother. Well, in John chapter 17 beginning in verse 21 down to 23 it says verse 21 that they may all be one talking about the disciples here but he's talking about you too even as you father are in me and i in you that they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me the glory which you gave me i I have given to them. Now, you see that? Wait a minute. Let me stop there. I used to say this. I used to say it all the time. I used to say a lot of stuff that wasn't right. But I used to say, he will not share his glory with anyone. Sounds real spiritual. Kind of like I swallowed the communion table. But look what he says. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. That's what it says. That they may be one just as we are one. You are as much one with the Father and with the Son and the Spirit as Jesus is because you're in him and he's in you. He says, verse 23, I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Now let me get a, let me say something else. <laughs> He loved you, says right here, them. And it's more than just the disciples. You're a disciple. He loved them just like the Father loved him. That's what he said. That is pretty big, I would say. In Acts 26, verse 16 through 18, he's talking about in me you have sight, and sanctification, the word sanctification, it's the same word we get the word holy from. It's the same word we get the word saint from. And your sanctification has nothing to do with you. It says in Colossians 3, 12, it says he chose you in him holy. That's how you were chosen. You were chosen holy. Let's read this, Acts 16, verse 16 through 18. But get up and stand on your feet. Now he's talking to somebody he's healing. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to things which you have seen, but also to things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people, from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Now, our sanctification is because of the faith of Jesus. It says this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. We are justified by the faith of Christ. It has nothing to do with us. We can't believe it. He is doing this. He is sharing this with people that have not believed him yet. Let me say this. Some of you believe that all this takes place once you're forgiven. Okay, I have no problem with that. And you're forgiven when you ask for forgiveness. And you're forgiven when you pray the prayer. 
Only one problem with that. When Christ said from the cross, and it was an aorist imperative, it was a command, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me tell you, at that point, the people he was talking about were the ones that were crucifying him. They're the ones that didn't believe him. That was you. That was me. He forgave first. Aorist tense, punctiliar, takes place. It's finished. It can't be done again. It's like a firecracker blowing up. It can only blow up one time. You don't reuse firecrackers. They're gone. And that's when you were forgiven. And it's finished. And it doesn't need to be done again. It's been done. It's completed action. Such a big deal. Well, we're going to see that in, I'm not going to read this because it's too much. But in Romans chapter 7, verse 8 through 21, we see that sin dwells in the flesh. And I'm not talking about the body that you, you pinch it or you cut it, you you pinch it, it hurts. You cut it, it bleeds. You hit it, it's bruised. I'm not talking about our, our fleshly body. When we're talking about flesh right here, we're talking about that part of you. And I'm going to just, just be as simple as I can. That thinks that you need to do something to be right with God. Something you do. Now, that's those that know him. And, and the people that, that don't know him, all they can do is live out of the flesh. And that's the part of them that tries to live a life. You can't do it in your own power. It was never that way. Well, sin dwells in the flesh, and there's no hope in the flesh. Flesh doesn't fix flesh. We have bad flesh sometimes, and we think, you know what we need to do? We need to do right. I had a friend that preached a message, and I thought it was good in the day. He called it, do right. We're going to do right. Got another friend that's got a ministry. It's called Do Right Ministries. And there's, I understand what he's saying. There's nothing wrong with wanting to, to do things right. Nothing wrong with that. But to think that you have any power in yourself to do right is foolishness. And many times we try to fix bad flesh with good flesh. But let me tell you what good flesh is. Flesh. Good flesh is flesh. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And today what we try to do, we try to avoid the bad side, the evil side of that tree, and we're going to eat from the good side. But what Yahweh, the one that created I am that I am, who was, I believe, the pre-incarnate Christ here, he said before Abraham was born, I am, he told Adam and Eve not to eat from, not to don't eat from the bad side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat from the tree at all. And that's what we do today in religion. We try to eat from the good side where he said, skip the tree. Don't eat from the tree. Eat from the tree of life. Eat from the Jesus tree. Eat from the believing tree, believing him. Well, that's what he said. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, he says, in me, we have the truth of Christ. In me, we have the truth of Christ. Let's look at this. In 2 Corinthians eleven ten, 10, he says, As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. You know, wherever you go, wherever you go, this boasting of mine, he's not talking about I'm bragging on me. He's talking about, He's boasting about Christ in me, the hope of glory. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, in me, now this is big, you have the power of Christ. In me, you have the power of Christ. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in, in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast. Here's Paul again talking about that. I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Folks, Paul had this, this uh, thorn in the flesh, and he asked three times for it to be removed. And what the Lord kept telling him was, my grace is sufficient. And Paul said, my weakness 
is uh, my my power is perfected in weakness. I think of some people. I think of Fanny Crosby. If you don't know who Fanny Crosby was, she was a, a lady that wrote so many hymns. Many of the hymns you've sung in the church were written by Fanny Crosby. She was a blind lady. And she understood things and she saw things because of her blindness that others with sight don't see. When God wants us to see him, we're not talking about a physical sight. Fanny Crosby used to say the first thing that she'll ever see, the first face that she'll remember is going to be the faith, face of Christ. Think about that. The face of Christ. Fanny Crosby. And there are many, many people like Fanny Crosby. Many, many. The next thing I want you to see is 2 Corinthians 13, 3. And this is huge. In me, it says, Christ who speaks in me. In 2 Corinthians 13, 3, since you are seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me, it's Paul talking, and who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. Now, this was directed and spoken to people who did not know him. It's directed to those that don't know him. And he says that the Christ in me who is in you is mighty in you. Do you realize that they don't understand that Christ is mighty in them? Unbelievers, Christ is mighty in them. Let me ask you a question. Can unbelievers do things that are, that are of God? They do every day. You know, there are some great scientists and great uh, medical people who have invented things, discovered things that have saved hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives. They've developed techniques. They've, they've done things for the world. They don't know it. It's Christ in them. In Galatians 1.16, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The Son is revealed in me. Paul said that. He's revealed in me. Galatians 1.16. It says it pleased him to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him. And the English here is a terrible translation. It says in the English, among the Gentiles. But in the Greek, the word is ain. Let me read it again. To reveal his son in me, that word is ain, in me, so that I might preach him in the Gentiles. Not to the Gentiles, not among the Gentiles, but in the Gentiles. He said, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. I didn't consult with people. You know why? Because even in that day, they would have said, Paul, what you're telling them is not right. But it was. This is Paul, one of the authors of the New Testament, the one that wrote the biggest majority of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, Christ in me, so that I might preach him in the Gentiles. And that word Gentiles is the word nations. And if you take it back, the primary meaning for that word is the family of man to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him in the family of man. Jesus referred to himself as the son of man. He's the firstborn of many brethren. Why would the creator of the universe speak to Paul in Paul so that he would speak him, Christ, in the Gentiles. Well, in Galatians 2.20, another great verse, Christ lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is, look at this, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives, here it is, in me. Where is Christ? In me. That and the life which I now live in the flesh. Now, this is the physical body. We're not talking about the part that sins. We're talking about the physical body here. But Christ who lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. And whichever translation you read gets this right or it doesn't. The New American Standard, the NIV, some of the modern translations, it says, I live by faith in the Son of God. And folks, that makes it what you do. The King James actually translates this right, and here's what the Greek says. There is no, pre there is no preposition in this sentence, but uh, the Son of God, this is what we call a genitive of possession. That means it owns the word that comes before it, so it would be, I live by faith that's owned by the Son of God.
I live by the faith of the Son of God. The King James translates it that way and it gets it right. And I'm not a King James guy either. But I'm telling you, they got that right. I live by the faith that is owned by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And that word for, it's who pair. It means instead of. Wow. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, if I translate this verse literally, I'll just try to do it, just a literal translation. It would be, I have been crucified, Christ. Doesn't say in Christ. I have been crucified, not with Christ. There's nothing there. I've been crucified, Christ. Christ, genitive of possession, he owns the crucifixion. When he was crucified, I was too. Then he says, not me living now. Do you see that? Not me living now. It is Christ living in me. Christ living in me. He lives in me. The crucifixion, I've crucified because he was and I'm in him. I'm alive, living because he is and I'm in him. It says this shows our oneness. It can't be separated. The oneness that we have in Christ. Now you have an idea, and I had this idea for many, many years, that the oneness of Christ comes after we pray a prayer or do something. Fold our hands, bow our heads, do something. But from God's perspective, the oneness of Christ has always been. Now people are living as if it's not so. They don't believe it because nobody's ever told them. You tell them. The oneness of God is from eternity past. Believe it. We're included in Christ based on what he did. Then he says, we do live a life in the flesh now, this fleshly body. In time we do, but we are still and presently also in eternity. And then he says, I live, this word live means to abide. I abide. I've taken up residence. It's not just talking about being alive. I abide by the faith that is owned by the Son of God, by Jesus Christ himself. By his faith, faith we're justified, Galatians 2.16, by the faith of Christ. By his faith, we live. Now, here's what I see people talking about and doing. They feel, okay, I can accept that it's the faith of Christ that justified me. By the way, the word justified, the word righteous, it's the same root word. Justification, justice, all the same root. And we're justified, declared righteous based on what Christ did and the fact that God the Son believed God the Father, that what he did on the cross was enough on your behalf. We're saved one way, people think, and yet we live by another. Now that we've been saved by grace through faith, by the grace of God, by the faith of God, through Christ his Son, now we live the best we can. Do your best. By my faith in Christ. I understand what they're saying. I don't have any real problem with that because it is my faith in Christ. But you see, Christ has given me his faith. I'm believing him for what he's already done. When I have this attitude, it changes everything. I'm going to say again, share this with everybody that you see. You can share it on Facebook or wherever. But share it. Tell people that they're loved, that they've been accepted, that they've been chosen, they've been included in him from eternity past because he wanted to that they've been forgiven from the cross. I know this, the cross is eternal. The cross was fleshed out in time, but in eternity it was already finished. That they were chosen before anything was created. And that in him we have love. Because that is his nature. 